today on the Perception and Action podcast. It's episode 400. And to celebrate, I was joined by a few friends to discuss something I'm very passionate about, the role of skill acquisition theory in coaching. Is it just psychobabble that confuses coaches? Is it effective or even possible to pick and choose a theory for different situations? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25 year journey as a researcher, professor, and high performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. Okay, welcome everyone to another edition of the Perception Action Journal Club. Um, we I don't know if people were attending, planning to attend. We got a little mixed up on time. I did anyway. Between uh, Arizona not doing daylight savings and GMT versus BMT uh, got me confused, but we're here. So, um, so this is what I'm doing. This is a thank you for everyone for coming. This is a recording I'm doing for the 400th episode of the podcast. So <laughs> you got to do something sort of special, um, I guess, but. Um, so let's, well, there's a few regulars I uh, will see. So Andrew, Stu, uh, Casey and Marianne, I'll just say hi and we'll hear from you soon. There's a couple of first timers, uh, Kathy, Sierra, can you tell us a little bit about you, Kathy? Uh, yeah, I have, uh, long, long ago, my degree was in, uh, kinesiology and I worked in the human world for, I guess, 15 years. Then left that world for computer science and started over. Uh, and now I actually teach programming and work with horses. Cool. So I found your podcast when I was looking for things on perceptual learning that I'm using to teach programmers. And then I was kind of shocked to realize that, wait, I can use this with the horses. <laughs> there's, there's another one of you, huh? <laughs> there's not just one ecological dynamics horse. I love person. that. It usually goes the other way. I can use this on the horses. Wait, I can also use it on my programming students. <laughs> oh, I love that you guys are taking it such a different direction. And Cal, Cal, welcome. I, we interacted tons on Twitter, but nice to see you, see you in person. Yeah, quite. Yeah. Nice to see you too. So, can you tell us a little about you, Cal? Uh, yeah, I'm a judo coach from North Wales. Uh, I've just finished my master's in sport coaching uh, in the process of getting a paper hopefully published looking at representative learning design. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining me. And um, so I wanted this to be kind of one of our usual open ended discussions. Um, what I the general topic I had was was thinking of is is this reoccurring one? We have the role of kind of the role and value of skill acquisition theory in coaching. Um, there's been a couple of things that have triggered me <laughs> recently. Um, one, uh, you know, we um, the MSAI um, Ireland kind of seminar series um, which just ended, and I had a, a great Q and A. There were some questions about that. We had kind of people commenting about it. Well, I'll, I'll call him out because he can, he can handle it. He's a big wig. Mark, Mark Williams, his quote was, skill acquisition theory is psychobabble that confuses coaches. Right? So he doesn't see it as any valuable. So that was one kind of thing. The other one was the, the discussion and debate that Michael Ashford and I had on uh, the Rugby Weekly podcast. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback about that. Um, in general, it's interesting. It's um, the feedback is, is people were glad we did it, but they weren't very satisfied with how it went. Mm -hmm. um, because 
the, the main comments I got, you know, people, we, it's like we were talking past each other a lot. Um, there wasn't any eff effort at making agreement or consensus, and the kind of agree to disagree <clears throat> ending wasn't very satisfying. Um, I would say all of that is making the main point I, would, I started with that they're two incompatible mm -hmm. ideas um, that you can't find a point of agreement, but um, but I think it's it was useful anyway. But that was kind of the general reaction. So I thought I would just maybe for those it, I think everyone probably has heard it here, but um, maybe we can start uh, by going there. Kind of your thoughts on on that our discussion, that general issue, um, anything around that. Maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Andrew, because you you were here first today. <laughs> yeah. You're asking me for opinions about this. I think I might have some. Um, yeah, I figured you would. <laughs> I, I have I have to admit, um, I thought that the whole process was more worthwhile than I had originally thought it was going to be. I thought the discussion was actually pretty useful. Um, uh, yeah, I thought it I thought it clarified a lot of things, and it, it it made both you and Mike kind of put your cards down and 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 commit to a few things, which I actually thought was pretty useful. So I had. I, yeah, I had had mixed feelings about how valuable it would be given the, just the fundamental incompatibility. But I thought as a conversation that people could listen to and sort of get a sense of the overarching thing, I thought that worked quite well. Um, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's it was it was a, it was a bit of a frustrating listen in some ways. Um, you know, Mike's Mike's position, like the the evidence base that they're using to come from this where they spend a lot of time asking coaches and players what they're doing. And then this kind of idea that was lurking under a lot of what he was talking about where because they were just talking to the coaches and talking to the players and just trying to figure out what it was that they were doing. There's, he was articulating this idea that they were just, they were just following the data and that they were just what the, 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 his framework and the things that they were doing and the things that the way they were interpreting things was just following the data. Um, there were there are just some facts about the way people do stuff, and they were just busy revealing those as opposed to what apparently we do, which is to take our theory and impose that onto the facts. And there was just like that. It was it was really interesting to hear that articulated out loud and clearly because it's been lurking for a long time, and I think. It's just, a, it's a huge problem, right? The very first thing I learned in philosophy of science is the theory dependence of observation, right? The data you collect depends pretty much entirely on your theoretical framing. The kinds of experiments I run don't find evidence for mental representations because I'm just not asking those kinds of questions and vice versa. And, and, and that's, not, that's not a bug. That's a feature of a theory. That's the whole point of having one. And you can't just... You know, I think I think it was like back in the 1600s. This is Francis Bacon just trying to, you know, do naive induction. You just collect a whole bunch of data and then you pull out the pattern from it, and you've you've arrived at the truth. And then, you know, one of the big results in philosophy of science is it just doesn't work that way. Um, and so that that notion of somehow we're it, it it shows up in the way that we get talked about as being biased, and we're not biased. We have a theoretical framework which is informing our data collection and the interpretation of the data that we collect. And that's perfectly normal, well behaved scientific activity. So I was, it was nice to hear that sort of out loud, just so that I could then kind of go, that's a problem if you think of that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And that's something that came across. And I've seen it, it was in the original paper too, the idea yeah. that there's just this objective reality that we can we can the game that we can look at without any theoretical viewpoint yeah um, i mean, I mean you so know. dave uh, dave gray's got that uh, there was a paper about the skateboarders that i uh, so i was reading through that and one of the reasons why they went and were looking at skateboarders was the idea that skateboarding is a world that doesn't have a lot of formal coaching and so the skateboarders tend to figure out their own ways of doing things and the pitch in the paper was and therefore this is a nice. This is a this is a place where we can go look to see what learning looks like without the interference of theory people, <clears throat> and and they were describing a bunch of stuff. And the funny thing for me, I was reading that paper, and there was a lot of the things that the skateboarders were saying. I was like, oh, I could totally interpret that. <laughs> from a ecosystems emergent kind of 
constraints led kind of point of view, like that would be totally fine. That's com like it's completely coherent. They're doing stuff that I would call a constraint. Um, and, and again, that's not a bug. Like that's just how it goes, you know. Um, and, and again, that's the other thing about the skateboarders. Yeah, like, I mean, has just dropped into the into the chat, right? It's not like skateboarders live off in their own little bubble and they never hear anybody talking about things. We live in a world that's utterly saturated. Whenever whenever anybody talks about the brain <coughs> or how thing how, how we learn and how memory works, all of that's informed by the dominant kind of conversation in pop psychology, and that dominant conversation is is traditional cognitive psychology. So. Yeah. Um, so that, that that I think it was really interesting to have articulated clearly and just have out there just to identify that that just isn't true. And if they think that that's a if Mike thinks that and he's really kind of committed to that idea, then that's a bit of a problem that he's going to have to at least reflect on. Um, and it it did at least clarify that part of the arguments I've gotten into at various points where I've tried to figure out why you know what, what, why am I always accused of being biased. You know, um, and it's when all I have is a is a specific theoretical framing. But anyway, yeah, no, no good points. Huh? Kathy, I'll go across my <laughs> screen here. Kathy, what are you, your reflections on either that specific div, uh, recording? Yeah, or, I, or, yeah. I have just two little things, but first, when you said skateboarding, um, so in college I was a sponsored skateboarder, and wow. at the same time that I was heavily steeped in studying the deliberate practice way. I Once I became uh, at a level where I was on this team and all of their other people on the team, this was Santa Cruz Skateboards, was world class. I was the only one who wasn't. So there was some pressure to do all these tricks. And I was trying to deliberate practice my way into them because I thought, okay, I, I know how to do this. And it was a, it was just a disaster. And so finally, you know, they all started yelling at me, just don't overthink it, you know, just do it. <laughs> and then, of course, that's what worked and it was such a big turning point. But at the same time, I spent the next, you know, 15 years forgetting that and acting like that was somehow a magical exception, which, of course, it wasn't. Uh and if your conversation, I mean, I'm going to admit that since I'm a practitioner applying this now with horses, it just doesn't come up for me, right? I'm all in for other reasons on self-organization and the whole thing. So I don't really think about them having mental models. There's no declarative information that I'm giving them, Uh so I haven't really thought about it that much. But then the two of you, Andrew and Rob, you both sort of gently schooled me when I said something about prediction. And this is the one question. I just want to know how to articulate that from an ecological dynamics framework, the idea of what I would always think of as the neuroscience prediction error thing. And you said, no, there's no, there is no prediction. So how do you talk about surprise and things like that. Yeah. Um, I actually, I'll foreshadow that. Well, there's a, um, Matt Dix and a, one of his grad students, Harry just had a really good paper come out on kind of an ecological view of deception surprise. So I'm going to have, a, you know, in terms of affordances okay. and stuff. So, um, I'll definitely be getting into that. Um, okay. Um, yeah, it, it, that's a, that's a tricky one. You know, um, I think, you know, instead of thinking prediction, I think acting towards the future, which that perspective control is acting, behaving towards the future without predicting it. So, that, they, you know, that's it's it's the kind of getting into the semantics of what a prediction is <laughs> a little oh, bit. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Which, okay. Can I, Andrew, that's I what I want to understand. Yeah. Can I can I just one sure. little thing? The way, the way I sort of think about this, so I always go back to my good old fashioned outfield of problems as a nice concrete example, right? So, <clears throat> There's two ways of thinking about what the outfielder is doing when they're trying to catch the ball. One is that they're predicting where the ball's going to go and then acting on the basis of that prediction. And the other thing is that they're tracking the ball in a, in a way that enables them to get to a point at the right place at the right time to intercept the ball. And the argument about prospective control is that um, if, you, if you were able to have a look and see what was going on inside the nervous system, then nothing there would be no information in the nervous system about where the ball's going to end up. In a very real sense when you're doing prospective control, the organism doesn't know where they're going to end up. 
<clears throat> that's the like that's one way of thinking about what the difference is and, and, and taking really seriously the idea that actually you can get to a point in the future at a different spatial location without even knowing where you're going to be until you're there. And that's the, the, like, a, a, like that's obviously not like a slam dunk argument. That's just the conceptual difference. Right. And so I always think about it. With, if you look at outfielders, right, they have no idea where they're going to end up. They're just right. acting. Yeah. I think I meant more in terms of something very unexpected. So, and maybe prediction error was the, the wrong word, but it was mm-hmm. like, how, how do you, how do you cope with something where you just didn't expect anything was going to happen and suddenly there's something there or does it even matter? It's just there. <laughs> No, I think I think you know uh, there would be cases where you would look at the in, the level of information, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, something not being specified, like you can. That's what happens in illusions, right? You can still get things wrong in ecological psychology because it's underspecified with with the information, right? Um, it's not very. It doesn't happen very often because <laughs> if you ex- actively explore your environment, you have, almost have to contrive it. But um, surprises is the arrival okay. of new information. Think about it that yeah. way. Yeah. Okay. That. Yeah. No, but it is. It, yeah, I definitely. Um, I got a lot. Got a lot of good feedback about Andrews and my discussion about memory. So I, I want to keep doing those kind of where we get into some of the tough, uh, tackle some of the traditional cognitive psychology ideas <laughs> in, from ecological Please. framework. Even though we can't, you know. So uh, that will be one of them for sure. We'll, we'll get into. Thank you, S- Stu. I know you. I'm interested to hear your thoughts because I know you. Well, you've debated a ton <laughs> online, and you, I know you've you've thought about doing this kind of discussion before. Well, you've invited people for a long time and without success. But what what are your thoughts on kind of the our discussion or this topic in general? Um. Well, first things first, Rob. Uh, Four hundred. You know. You got to rate. If it, if it was cricket, you'd be raising your bat, you know. Because, <laughs> um, you know, having celebrated my two hundred and thinking I was doing pretty well, to then just like totally one up me with four hundred, <laughs> I've really got to up my game. So anyway, well done. Um, Thanks, and um, and also, I want to echo Andrew's Andrew's uh, points about uh, the value of it. Uh, you changed my mind a bit as well. I had got to a point where I thought that doing something like that would be fruitless um, because of the potential for it to become, uh, you know, essentially just a a kind of point scoring exercise to a certain extent, Um, which I think is, as you've said, and I know you've reflected on this yourself in your latest uh, podcast, you know, which I think the social media space tends to throw you into that kind of adversarial sort of back and forward you know that other people are watching as well and that probably makes you act in other ways that aren't quite as as conducive to productive debate shall we say so actually the medium itself the i mean it's quite interesting because you know started off with you know dan acting as the kind of i suppose the in theory mediator but in reality didn't really need to be involved that much did he because (laughs) the back and forward just worked quite well but you entered into it the pair of you entered into it in the right spirit, I think, and it was it was done in good faith. And I think when a conversation is done in good faith, despite there being, you know, because there were times when, you know, it was quite edgy. You, mm-hmm. you asked some probing, edgy questions and, you know, you kind of asked for clarification that was really interesting. And I think that shows, you know, the kind of when when two people enter into a dialogue like that, that actually there is. There's, there's a value in the process of that, regardless of the outcome. So I can understand people's frustrations because we didn't come to a nice, n- nice, like, you know, wrapped bow finished point where everybody's happy and everybody's sweet and everybody goes away feeling really satisfied. But that's not the nature of dialogue anyway, particularly when you're coming from such different, different, different perspectives. The value was you were circling around the problem together. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, the fact that you didn't have enough time to be able to circle long enough to find a consensus point. OK, it's not the end of the world. The circling process is actually have got a, a real value anyway. A couple of just very just sort of, a couple of thoughts I had about the conversation about, you know, when people say you were talking past each other. Um, you were, but it was because you were coming from such very different perspectives. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he, he was talking about the things people do. 
and then almost trying to sort of create a. Re- or this is how I. This is my interpretation. Okay, I could be misrepresenting, but let me just say this is how. I re- These are the things people do in 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 real life. This is what rugby coaches do. This is common practice in rugby, and we're going to kind of work backwards to make sense of why that might be. So we're creating a theory from the practice. Um, you're coming from it, uh, but also he was also talking about this is what people do in order to coordinate action. Um, this is how they basically clarify intention so that they've got a, a clear idea about what they might try and do in a situation, in, in a, in a situation use. And he kept using set pieces. No, interestingly, mm-hmm. and obviously set pieces are fixed by their nature. They're not dynamic. It's not as easy to do something like that in a dynamic environment, but people try, but in the set piece environment, you know, you can say we're going to do this move, this call, et cetera, et cetera. And that is a way of getting everybody to almost it's choreography. It's short language shorthand for choreography. You know, so it's a way of saying this is the dance we're going to do here. Mm-hmm. And I understand all that. And that's great. But what you kept saying was, yes, but once you've clarified intention. What helps you then to actually move <laughs> You know, in accordance with this clarified intention. And if there are um, sort of idiosyncrasies to the intention, i.e. the delivery isn't right or the lift isn't right or whatever it might be, what happens then? How do we make the kind of adaptable micro adjustments in order to be able to perform the movement, you know, what which we would describe as skillful movement? And And fundamentally, that's where the breakdown occurred, because what I could never hear Michael say, and I don't think it was his fault. I think it was just the perspective he was coming from. He never quite got that point that you were making, which was that clarifying movement doesn't doesn't drive movement. That's just (laughs) what you'd like to do. It doesn't actually then drive how you do it. And so, you know, you're coming from the perspective of understanding how we move, what why and how and everything else. And the mechanisms, understand the mechanisms for that. He's coming from the perspective of this is what people do. And so we're going to call that something. We're going to call that a shared mental model. And then there is this almost implication that that's what drives movement. And that's where the fundamental disagreement is. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, I think that's also why he wants to map onto both. Because I think he wants to say, we've got this declaration of intention which we call a shared mental model or whatever it is we're going to call it. And we we do that. And then we go into eco world to actually then move within that framework. Mm-hmm. So that's where I think he was trying to come from. Right. And there might be something interesting in that. I don't know. I'm not I'm, my my personal jury is out as far as that's concerned. I actually don't think that necessarily needs to map on at all, because having a declared intention and most sports have these. You know, it's a shorthand way of saying we're going to do this. That's just common practice. But I actually think it's a real failing. And it's done because it's a very quick and easy way of getting this choreography to take place. Whereas in reality, in the area that I'm really interested in exploring more and what the podcast made me think about or what the conversation made me think about was, is there a better way even to coordinate these preset choreographies? using relevant information as a means by which to create the coordination which then means then instead of it instead of it breaking down because something goes wrong there's no such thing as something going wrong there is just what there is and we can use what we have whether it's coordination of opposition whether it's the delivery whether it's the whatever we can use whatever we're given and adapt to it on the fly therefore there is no going wrong There is just the movement dependent on the other variables. And it's made me really think about that. And I think, actually, maybe there's a better way of training set piece, even set piece, that would make them almost foolproof. Um, uh, Anyway, sorry, I'm I'm rambling on. No, no, no. There were just some some thoughts I was just playing around with since the conversation. Yeah, no, no, Stu, I think it's it's, there's a couple points I, I tried to make there, you know, that what you observe, it doesn't mean that you can't do better, right? You can't do something else, right? Uh, if you're going to train people like a military, you know, battalion, yes, it's going to look like <laughs> they have mental, you know, so that, that was a point. And yeah, I was a bit surprised by, uh, I don't know whether everyone else would agree that 
you know, on the, uh, the other side of the fence, very basically, Mike seemed to say, oh, I, all the perception, the actual movement and control of movements all explained by your theory. I just want to tack on to the start, tack on to it at the start, which I would be surprised if many people completely agree with that. So predictive that throws predictive processing out the window, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, Casey, it, uh, interested in your, you know, as someone that you know, maybe you're closer. Well, Stu also to kind of Michael's perspective of someone that's actually coaching <laughs> day to day and has to deal with this kind of taking this, uh, you know, white lab coat dichotomy and actually applying it so what what are your some of your thoughts yeah um i think my theoretical positions uh at least in my circle is probably well documented and i don't know that i have any particularly you know powerful revelation that i could add on to the things that andrew and kathy and Stu have said already um, i can say a couple things first uh rob i, I think um I, I want to give you a shout out. I think uh, doing this was necessary and and uh, the way you handled it was great. I want to give a shout out to Mike because I would say the exact same thing to him. I don't know him personally. I've interacted with a couple of his colleagues, um, but I just I was really impressed. I was expecting this, uh, you know, this pitchforks and torches and and uh, it by and large, I, I was really impressed. It was a, what I would consider a very mature conversation where two perspectives didn't uh, quite match up perfectly. And, and it probably as it sounds like the majority of us expected. Um, and, uh, but I just think I was really impressed to the point where I'd love to, to reach out to Mike and, and just have him flesh some of those ideas out further. So I can understand the, his position a little bit better uh, to challenge my own one that I think is probably relatively similar to yours, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I found, which, uh, and Cal might be able to speak to this, but um as a practitioner who spends the majority of his time interacting with other practitioners, um, I was amazed at how useful the conversation was to just demonstrate to a coach who probably is not familiar with any academic or, or theoretical information that there is even a debate here. And, and I know that that sounds uh, maybe you know, lower level or whatever, but the deal is uh, so many people wrote to me and said, hey, have you did you listen to this? And I go, yeah, you know, I, 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 this has been going on for a little while now. Um, but they were like, I had no clue that there was like a, a debate because in our sport, what happens so often is coaches will read usually like some pop psych book, you know, uh, outliers or whatever. And they'll go, look, I'm coaching by science, 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 science. You can't argue it. And I, and my response is, like, hey, if you guys only knew the, the arguments that go on in quote unquote science, uh, you'd probably be shocked. And um, this is the thing that I have to keep reiterating is that this is not anywhere close to being settled. So for us to say we're coaching via science, you do need to take a stance and, and kind of own up to that stance. You can't hide behind, hey, uh, this spreadsheet says this, so I'm good. And uh, that was for me uh, and the people that, that I interact with on probably most frequently, that was one of the most powerful points this is for the average lay person coach uh, to be exposed to this idea that, man, these PhDs, these highly respected researchers are debating this stuff and aren't coming to a consensus. I have some latitude here to take a stance. Now, obviously, the stance that I choose to take aligns with yours pretty closely, Rob, and probably most of the people mm -hmm. on this call. But uh it just, it, it debunked this idea that science meant fact, science meant uh, no argument. Uh, and that's something that has kind of plagued our sport, I think. So for that, I, I mean, I speak for any coach who's been in, invested in sp sports science, sport pedagogy at all. That's, we owe you and Mike a huge thanks because you're, you, that conversation opened a lot of people's eyes, at least in volleyball here in the States to the idea that, Hey, look, this is not settled. And there are there's rigorous, uh, very there's rigorous research, very intelligent people doing that research um, who disagree. And that's OK. And we we're working on coming to a consensus. It's going to take a long time, a lot more resources than the field probably has. But uh, it, as it stands currently, uh, there's no consensus. And you may have to take a stance on your own to th and think through this critically. Yeah. Well, thanks, Casey. I, I appreciate that. And yeah. Part of me, what I wanted to do, or what I would like, I want to like redirect the debate, <laughs> get it back on track. I had a comment when I was doing the one for the MSA Ireland. People were like, well, you should be building on the people that have been debating in this in the past. And 
I said, I would love to. I would love to continue on Newell versus Schmidt, right? Theory versus theory. The problem is we somehow got off theory versus it depends, <laughs> uh, which is very hard to debate and I don't find very productive. Like I, I would happily debate your theory versus my theory <laughs> in, in specifics of how it works and things like that. But I don't know how you debate theory versus I don't need a theory or I can pick and choose my theory. That's much less productive to me. That's, that's something I found a bit frustrating. So I was glad we could, if we could get that a little bit more focused, like I think shared mental models versus shared affordance is a good example where there's two opposing things you can debate. And I think that that really helps help me anyway. But, but uh, Cal, let's hear, I know you had, you've had some, you know, you, I think you, uh, I also think you kind of you, you have sympathy for Mike's position, I would say, because you, in the game, some of the things people use, like call outs, and, I, and you, know, you said some really good points on, on Twitter. There's some things that are clearly people are using that really we haven't really fit well into ecological dynamics. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was quite fortunate, really, that uh, Mike was sort of gracious enough with his time to jump on a call and talk through a bunch of the stuff that he covered in the uh, in the debate itself. So uh, it seems as though there's far more commonality than there is disagreement. Um, it was, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but my, my, my perspective from the discussion was that he was essentially in favor of an ecological approach for the vast majority of the time. I was essentially saying, uh, if it was the case that we had shared mental models and that you do have these representations, then doing unopposed technical rehearsal drills would make sense. You know, doing it to sort of ingrain a mental model, you're doing it for a reason. Uh, but he, he kind of agreed that he wouldn't use drills. He was saying uh, that he'd very rarely use unopposed drills. Um, so it seems, as I say, that it seems there's far more in common than there is difference between uh, his perspective and what I would call ours. Uh, what I found really interesting was he was claiming his position was atheoretical. So he wasn't saying that I'm information processing. He was saying that there there is no theory that I subscribe to, uh, which seems absurd to me. Like the if they can marry together, then it is a theoretical position to suggest that they can. Um, the issue is when you mention it depends. It seems as though that's used to Mott and Bailey consistently. You can you can say it depends with anything. If somebody asks me if homeopathy is effective, I can say, well, it depends. <laughs> you know, if you don't have cancer, homeopathy is probably better than chemotherapy. But it seems like a little bit weaselly to me. Um, yeah, so I'm not, not a big fan of that. Uh, uh, yeah, so the, I think the big thing that we came to that he said, the dividing line between everything being ecologically based and going into shared mental models was when people make a call for a set play and people follow the command. So if I'm, I'll use rugby because it was in a rugby context. Uh, if I was a scrum half, if I was a player whose job it is to feed the ball to other people and I noticed that the defenders are in the wrong position and I want my team to run on a different line, I want them to run a really narrow line so we can exploit a defender, I can make a call. I can shout, crash ball, or I can call for a play and his contention was that the players on your team have to be aware of the plays. They have to recall what the play is and what their uh, response to that call is. So as soon as I say crash ball and my center knows what I want him to do, he wants him to, wants me, he wants him to run that line. At that point, he's saying that that memory is shaping action. My contention was I'm not sure how it directly shapes action. It seems as though there's... Uh, a difference between remembering and knowing as well. I think when you and Andrew had your uh, ecological memory thing, it was really illuminating for that. Like we don't have to remember that we can't pick up a football with our hands when we're, or soccer, sorry. We don't have to remember that you can't handle a ball in soccer. It's just something that we know. I'm not constantly having to recall and remember that. I think it's probably, my assumption is that there's probably something similar going on when people make a call for a play it shapes where I want to be running, but it doesn't help me run. It doesn't, I can't coordinate my run based on that information. So I'm not sure where the overlap is. Yeah, no, that's, that's great, Kyle. I, I, and I, I 
appreciate you reaching out to him. I think that's, you know, I think it's what, you know, what I, you know, a simple explanation I would give that's, we still need to work on it is, you know, a call out changes my intention, which changes the information I pick up, which I have a control law that is built from experience. So it looks like I remember, <laughs> you know, so the, the, the big one, you know, I think, you know, that I, you know, I was trying to admit that, you know, the, this, the, the throwing everything into a ten, intention is, mm-hmm. is a kind of a, a sticking point. I think, in, you know, I know Andrew, when we were talking this about it when the memory one, it's, it's something we need to kind of thresh out a bit more and, 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 and fill out a bit more. Cause I think that's what people find frustrating, but um, yeah, I, I, I de- part of me, I don't think people, what is, what do you mean by mental model? Like, yeah. That's a part of the problem I have. Like you don't need a mental model to understand a word, right? To, to react to the word stop. <laughs> I don't need a mental model for that. Uh, that's, that's kind of the frustration I have a little times with a mental model, you know, is, is something way more than that. If you really want to be literal about it. But, yeah. yeah. It seems as though yeah. if, if a direct call, was used to shape somebody's actual action. And when you make a call and somebody fumbles the ball, you'd still run through the play. You know, if I'm <laughs> if I've dropped the ball and I've called for a run, my other players don't run. They don't get to the position they were supposed to be in. They're looking. They're looking at the defense to see where best to run. They're looking at me to see how they should be shaping to receive the catch. So yeah, it seems as though there's a very very gray area there but i don't think that just tacking on well they've got this mental model and they're recalling stuff and that shapes i think it seems a bit of a get out of jail free card to me yeah yeah no no obviously i was trying that's what i was trying i i don't think it explains anything really it describes could describe something that happens but i don't know if it explains anything in, in any meaningful way Oh, and sorry, just one one last thing. Oh, cause, sure, go. Because it's been bothering me. Uh, yeah, one of the big issues, as I see it, with uh, a lot of the work that's been done is they're framing what coaches' perceptions of what they're doing as an objective fact. So, or a person who's being coached. So when you did this action, what was going on? And as you say, the, the dominant heuristic the dominant theory that exists is sort of computer it's all computer analogies so they're it just trips off the tongue they're saying what they think has happened not what has actually happened it seems to base a bunch of papers on what people think is happening is a little bit flawed to me yeah yeah i i I kept going back to that you might have noticed in our debate that i uh, that's why i you know i was trying i was trying to get a balance of being you know, cooperative, but, uh, you know, you have to be sort of interruptive. <laughs> I, to, I could listen to Mike describe a rugby player for 20 minutes and then say, okay, I don't agree with any of that. So I kept, I didn't want to be too aggressive and interruptive, but you have to at some times. But, uh, Marianne, last but not least, <laughs> we come around this circle. <laughs> I, um, I don't want to uh, re- repeat anything that anyone has said so far. And obviously there's an awful lot there that I agree with. Um, I, and like Kathy, I spend a lot of time, obviously, working with sentient beings that are not human. And that adds a constraint in its own, which is really interesting. And one of the things, I guess one thing to say about the whole conversation was, um, I agree that it was it was good, it was really interesting, it was worthwhile having. It showed that there isn't an absolute, that there's still the disagreement. Um, but I think it was really useful at laying sort of cards on the table and showing actually some of the disagreement isn't just straw men, it is there, or certainly, you know, which, which was which I think was really useful. Um, the thing that kept coming to my mind was this idea of like a set piece, which I know a couple of you have mentioned, Stu, Cal particularly, and animals learn set pieces. You know, I worked a search dog for years, I trained a search dog for years, and basically, as soon as he found, we used to call him a body, usually alive obviously often out for a walk just somebody you know minding their own business having a nice picnic um and he would bark as an indication come back to me indicate go back to the body indicate come back to me indicate he would then start going into the set piece that gets me to that person that gets his reward which is play um and he would click into it there is obviously no way that I sat down and had a conversation with him around our strategy for that set piece and a shared mental model. It, 
you know, <laughs> not an option. But he learned. And again, it's through that changes in intention through experience. Um, uh, other things that, you know, easy to, to bring up are, um, you know, a real classic that I mentioned in, and, and actually I'm on podcast number one, which is also a big thing for a question <laughs> 400 is long way away, clearly. Um, you know, um, watching somebody, uh, you know, video of somebody falls off their horse really early in a show jumping arena and the horse carries on jumping. But what was interesting for me was the horse carried on jumping the course. It hadn't walked the course, but courses are always the same. They're like nice S curves. You go across the diagonal, down the other side, across the diagonal again. So each level, there is a pattern that is a set piece. And this horse is jumping the jumps in the correct order. Again, no mental model, but it is repeating experience. And, and yeah, those are the places I go to. It's just like, you know, for Kathy and I, we can't, we're clearly don't have the option of going there. We wouldn't anyway because of, you know, the way we think about things, but it makes it much more fascinating. And we're, we're talking about dyads of two different species that are both sentient, both learn. The beauty of an ecological approach is that it works for both. Um, but set pieces are still a huge part of performance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. yeah. I think that the great points, Marianne. And I think that makes me, it makes it, you know, some of the things I also, you know, I think there's a few people I've heard that, you know, there seems to be a lot of common ground between us and think to that. To me, the common ground is we're trying to explain the same behavior, <laughs> right? We're trying to explain the same thing. The common ground is not in the explanation. Uh, that's that's something I get frustrated a little bit. I don't think there's much common ground at all in the explanations, unless you, well, there is when you mix and match theories. <laughs> Whenever your theory comes into mind, then it, there's perfect alignment. But otherwise, um, yeah, no. So I think that's, you know, for sure that we're, so um, the, con the, the thing, you know, I'm not denying that there's these kind of realities and things in the environment where I'm just explaining them how they occur in a different way. Right. So I think it's, I think that's a point I keep, I keep getting. So does anyone out want to jump in with some, I see Andrew un, unmuting there. So, yeah, that was all really interesting. I was just, I'm, I'm just scribbling notes. I'm just, there were two things I think that were thinking that I just kind of had been thinking about as well that were coming out in the conversation. And the first thing, you can have direct perception for some stuff and representations for other stuff is a fairly long-standing like idea in cognitive science you know so uh andy clark had a paper in the 90s about where he invented you know he came up with the phrase representation hungry problems right and the idea was that you know mere perception action might work uh, ecologically but there are still things that are there's still things that we do like thinking about things in their absence that seem to require representational support and one of the like one of the big moves that happened just sort of that here's the history of it to channel Jeff Bingham for a second the history of it is that you know there's this notion of there's this sort of continuum of cognition from the really simple stuff to the really complicated stuff and for a long time all of it was considered to be representational and then a lot of cognitive psychologists and Andy Clark's paper was coming out at a time when people were recognizing that the ecological approach had made a good case that at least some stuff didn't need representations, right? So the idea was that there was this dividing line and Clark was seeding some ground. He was like, look, um, it's, you know, we, we might not need representations for some of this stuff. And so the ecological approach has established this beachhead and done good work and actually pushing that line up further than maybe we thought it was ever going to go. That's great. But there's still this box on the other side of that line of representation hungry problems. And what happened for a long time was just, we were just arguing about where to draw that line. Um, and then, but, you know, for me, you know, the, the argument I made a long time ago in the um, embodied cognition is not what you think it is, paper, right? The whole point of that argument was that actually as soon as you allow embodiment and as soon as you allow ecological stuff to start to come in, then actually it starts redefining all of the other work. And so all of you have to start again. And that's the big pitch that we make, right, is that <clears throat> our job is to we're we're making the bet effectively that there's an ecological explanation for all of these things and we're gonna but we're gonna have to do that reframing work as we work our way up and one of the other things and this leads me to the other thing that i was thinking about one of the other things that comes out of that the argument and the debate is that um there's a lot of unpaid debts from the ecological approach right there's a lot of stuff 
sensible challenges like what about language? What about X, Y, and Z? There's a lot of stuff that we have placed down markers to say that we're going to get there and we haven't got there yet. And that that's okay. We haven't got there yet, but it is a fact that we haven't got there yet. And we do owe people explanations for those eventually. So it was one what that was one of the other things that was coming out to me was that it, it was a good reminder. Like I like to talk a big game about how ecological psychology is going to explain everything because that's where I, I like I, I've convinced myself that that's the way to go, and I've also convinced myself that taking that stand and just pushing it and seeing how far I can go with it is the way to do my science. Um, but it's a good reminder that these are hard problems, and the and the big one that keeps coming up, and you mentioned that we were chatting about it in the memory thing about intent. What the hell is intention, right? Mm. So. Um, we talk about intention a lot. We talk about the education of intention, right? That comes out of the direct learning paper. They were talking about sort of education of intention, like how you learn what it is you're supposed to be doing, education of attention, how you learn to actually coordinate with the relevant information variables and the task dynamics, and then calibration where you have to, you know, scale your actions to the current task demands. Thinking about this lear- an ecological learning process over multiple time and space scales, but that big box of education of intention, there's nothing in there right now. Or at least there's a, there's some stuff, there's some ways of thinking and talking about these things. Um, but there's not a lot of empirical work that I know of, and it's a, it remains it remains a bit of a box that we're throwing quite a lot into. So I think it's I think it's important that we're honest about that. And I think that was one of the things that was coming out from his challenges. Um, so I thought that was quite important. You know? Yeah, no, I definitely agree, Andrew. And then, you know, I guess. The point I, you know, the reason, one of the reasons I I like ecological psychology approaches, for me, the whole field of cognitive psychology, as it applies to action, is all unpaid debt, <laughs> right? Um, like, if you believe in predictive, show me a predictive processing model that can swim, swing a tennis racket, and then I'll, I'll start being convinced, right? And None of it, ex- it's just descriptions of, it's shifting the problem. And I know been, you agree. <laughs> know it's just really funny because, of course, Turvey's been really explicit about this recently. There's yeah. this Dan Dennett phrase about um, loans of intelligence where you just mm-hmm. you borrow the intelligence of a shared mental model to explain things, for example. And you're making a loan, right? You're borrowing some, some intelligence and putting it into the system. And the question is, and, and, and the bet of cognitive psychology has always been that they're going to be able to pay that off by grounding those representations somehow. And Turvey's big thing, you know, coming out in his textbook, you know, the, the phrase is now, unrepayable loans of intention uh, of intelligence and actually yeah we're putting down markers we think we can pay them off and we're pretty sure that the other guys can't so so you're right i think we we're all on the hook absolutely for a lot of really important things um but and but then also again just just to just to flag up there are arguments about who's going to be able to pay this off Right. There's reasons to suspect that representations aren't going to be able to pay it off, for example. And those reasons are not just dogma. They're they're not necessarily going to be slam dunk arguments, but they are. There's clear articulations of the concerns, for example, that are out there that 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 raise real doubts about the ability of representations to ever pay the debt off, which is why. Turvey goes to information and the laws that underpin it and all those things as as a source of. So, yeah, anyway, so it is a big problem. But again, I just want to flag up. It's not like we're ignoring it. It's just that we no, haven't felt sure. it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. That, that's a very valid point, Andrew. And I think, you know, um, you know, we think you do need to acknowledge that. I want to, you know, I guess, you know, so, Kathy, I may want to go back to you. And, and you know, the, this kind of other issue of the, the value of going all in, picking a side, aligning with the theory. I know that you know i think part of it you you explain part of it is in the nature of the what you're working with uh, kind of um predicts but can you talk a little bit about you know it, do you see a is there a value in kind of aligning with a specific theory versus picking and choosing things um what, do, what in your experiences oh i wouldn't say there's a value for me it's basically that is where all the value lives because I mean, well, you know, I've heard you say you're either self, you're either all in on self organization or you're not. A movement is either self organized or it's not. But because I was, well, still am interacting with, you know, thousands of horse people who were coming into all of this science new, um, I didn't 
take the time to explain that self-organization is different from saying organizing yourself, right? That the idea of complexity and what you actually get out of it. So uh, the biggest problem that we have, and I, I think I see it coming out with, with you guys who teach humans too, is that coaches want to do, you know, yeah, self-organization is great and all until the athlete needs help. So they want to step in. And then the moment they step in, it's like, well, now you can't actually even use the movement that you get as an indicator of anything. So people will just end up with something worse. So it's almost like pick a side, either you micromanage and shape that movement because you've already decided to be the puppeteer or you give the system what it absolutely needs to self-organize. And what we see with, well, with the horses and I trying to think back to my human coaching days is that it's very easy for the straw man of, yeah, but if you just leave people alone and you don't give them any help, you know, it's clear they organize bad movements. Um, and especially with some of the horses who, if we haven't actually helped them use environmental uh, targets and things to help understand the task or some authentic purpose, then uh, if we don't give the system enough quality diversity information, then of course it, it's not explored the landscape of possibilities. It's just going to use from its limited toolkit. And since just about every athlete has had training that focused on narrowing the toolkit, of course, the system has very little information to work with. It doesn't even know you can bend your knee at that angle. Why would it ever try to find a solution like that? So to me, it's all about how many ways can we expand the possibilities and Lately, I mean, I have students now that have been doing this for about five years, but only just now, a lot of them are starting to get it. And I'm seeing things like hashtag trust the process <laughs> <laughs> because it's just so tempting. And there's so much peer pressure uh, to not allow, quote unquote, bad movements. Now, I interact a lot with the physiotherapy world and the rehab world, and that's been a huge shift that they are starting to make that, whoa, we were completely wrong on saying these movements are bad. These movements are bad. These movements are bad. These are okay. And now it's sort of the opposite. And that's, that hasn't come to the equestrian world yet. So everything is instant danger signals. You know, people will say things like, I don't believe in that variability. crap. <laughs> what is that? Even? <laughs> you know, there's correct biomechanics and everything else is lava. And so that's kind of the tough part, but now I think, and Marianne, you know, I think you've seen there, there's starting to be momentum, but it's taken years and, you know, several thousand people to show that this isn't dangerous and you get absolutely incredible things. And since this is my first podcast, I still have to say, Rob, thank you, because this has done nothing less than save horses' lives, <laughs> right? You guys don't probably euthanize your athletes when they can't Hopefully function. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's that important. Yeah, I, I like yeah, that's great to hear, Kathy, and I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think there was a word in there you use. And, you know, sometimes I've gotten flack for using the word "believe" in this uh, on Twitter. You know, I'm a scientist. I'm not supposed to believe in things. I'm supposed to, you know. Uh, you know, determine whether they're right or wrong for fact from facts and evidence and things. But, um, you know, in my example, I work with baseball pitchers who young pitchers who, if they blow their elbow out at very least, I've set their career back two or three years and I could ruin their whole life, their goal in life. And I'm telling them to use heavy balls, throw off with different mounds. And like, if I honestly didn't believe that this is good, would I do it? Like, I don't think I, if it was just something I read in a book. Like, it's really a radical change. You know, I don't, but I honestly believe in it, you know, knowing that it's not a word you normally associate with scientists. But, um, Stu, um, you know, general thoughts or kind of, you know, you know, I'm interested, you know, I think one of the things we all share here is we not only are, you know, believers in this, but we also are want to help move it forward and educate people. And one of the things I was 
was a bit frustrated with in the, in some of the conversation I've had is people are accusing, you know, picking a side, uh, having uh, you got to go all in. I think your your phrase, Stu, was jumping off the dock into the water, right? Is is scaring people? It's being divisive. It, it it's being put down as a way that's scaring coaches away, and that's hard. That's hard for me to hear as a nice Canadian, <laughs> but. I, so I don't know. So, so any thoughts you have, Stu, on and then kind of about moving this forward? Well, I guess just to riff off Andrew and Kathy there, um, and and your point, Kathy, about you know euthanize athletes. Well, <laughs> well, I I would argue that if you were to you know why it's so important to me, and this goes back to your point about belief. So any theory. You know, there there isn't. I don't, there aren't many theories out there that that we have that um, you know we can say that is absolutely rock solid, and and we, you know it's like uncontestable. You know, because any theory is continuously under challenge, and that's how theories move on, isn't it? Because we're always you know, as I understand it anyway, and, you know, the, the scientific community keeps telling us this, is that what, we're, what we're constantly doing is we're just exploring the boundaries of how far our theory go, you know. So I like to think that as a practitioner, I'm taking a theory and exploring what its utility is in the real world, up to the point where I haven't got practical capability to do anything else. And then at that point, I probably then have to use an, an unsatisfactory tool from my previous education as a means by which to try and solve the problem, knowing that it's not really that good, but I just haven't got anything else right there in that moment. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the theory is wrong. It just means I haven't necessarily created the, the mechanism at the time to be able to think about it subsequently and then work out some different ways. Now, I think that's where this problem stems from, Rob, which is that you know, for a lot of people, the idea of not having all the tools at our disposal is a scary one. So it's like, I'll stay with what I've got for now because I feel comfortable with that. I'm interested in what you've got over there and I'm going to explore it, but I'm going to explore it while staying here where I'm safe. And the perspective often said is, well, you, you can't really do that. And that's seen as being divisive. Now, so I can understand the appeal of a group, you know, a kind of a, uh, 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 an academic group saying, well, actually, because this is not entirely knowable, you're better off taking a more of a kind of full on buffet approach and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. I get I get that. It's appealing, isn't it? And it appeals to people living in a practical world, dealing with practical problems, not having all the tools at their disposal. It's challenging. It's difficult. You're worried that you might get it wrong. So the idea of saying I can have a bit of both is, is a really appealing one. I've just come to a different conclusion. And this maybe this comes back to your point about belief. I've come to a different conclusion, which is I've done it one way for the bulk of my life in coaching and got got, got to a point where I found that really quite destructive for both me and athlete to the point where I look back on a lot of my early experiences as a coach with quite a heavy degree of shame. And I now I'm all in here. Why? Because I want to explore the boundaries of this, this opportunity. You know, I have a belief in this, so I'm now going to explore it in a practical context. And the reason I'm so, I'm so passionate about it is because I believe there is less potential for harm to be done. Whether that harm is people dropping out, whether the harm is injury, whether the harm is um, my own well-being, you know, wherever the harm is, I think there's less potential for that. Now, what proof have I got? Well, um, the proof I've got currently is my own sense of well-being, uh, the numbers of individuals returning on a regular basis, uh, which is in itself a problem, by the way because there's too many. Um, and for that matter, you know, just watching my 14 year old, for example, and his development, because he has been my N equals one experiment. You know, I've got another one on the way as well, but there's, this is the sort of first cab off the rank, so to speak. And taking this approach, this very non-linear, non-driven, experientially led approach at the moment, 
seems to be paying off in terms of the progress that is being made by 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 him and others that I've been working with over a period of time. So, OK, again, you know, anecdotal, nothing there that I can say is all, you know, and, and all that sort of stuff. But I just believe that going back to Kathy's point, trust in the process, I've had doubts. No, I've had doubts. I've had very interesting kitchen table conversations. <laughs> Shouldn't he be better by now? You know, and all those sorts of things. And it, it's I'm now having very different kitchen table conversations, by the way, um, which I'm pleased to say. I will record one, actually, because it is going to be interesting. <laughs> but anyway, I'll stop at that point. Oh, that that's great, Stu. And I, I think for me, there's a point there. And then, you know, I, I, I've i not as much as you guys, but I have to live in the practicalities of, of coaching. And for me, there's a difference between meeting a coach where they are and trying to move them to a more ecological approach versus that's not integrating or combining or any way. Like, so I, I have baseball coaches that go to the practice. They're using tons of tees and coordinated choreographed drills. I can't just rock up and say, you need to put all those tees on a bonfire, throw all that out. Right. I got to start with some meeting them where they are and try to pull them. But that doesn't mean I'm combining or, you know, mixing things. I'm just, I need to, you need to start where people are. And, and then, you know, I am always like, let's make that more game. Like let's add some variability and I hopefully keep moving them. So, and, and that leads me, uh, Casey, I wanted to ask you kind of about this or any other thoughts you have, but I know you've done this yourself. Right. And I think in talking to coaches, you do this, right. You kind of have gone from one very distinct approach and kind of had to move in your congrats on the new job, by the way, <laughs> but you've had, you had to move in your old job kind of systematically, right. To, to adding to the, the where people were existing. So can you tell like, what are some of the kind of practicalities of, of doing this, this ecological dynamics and your thoughts on that? <clears throat> yeah, well, um, man, that's a tough one. Um, I think, so my situation in my previous job was uh, really, really awesome. I was really fortunate that I had um, a boss supervisor had had honcho whatever you'd call him. Mm -hmm. uh, he was pretty entrenched in a you know more linear information processing approach, and he could probably uh, speak to uh, some things like schema theory and the Fitz and Posner three stage model. He he had you know just a real basic rudimentary understanding of that stuff. Um, but which, which for our sport was, was, is pretty advanced, you know, in terms of just classic sports science knowledge. Um, but, uh, I, I, I don't want to pretend like mine, my experience is a case study and, you know, <laughs> moving mountains because he was so, so generous with, uh, his flexibility and allowing me to design practices and stuff like that. And, and we had a bunch of good conversations. What some of the things that, that, um, move the needle. A lot of the, the non-linear child's non-linear pedagogy stuff was kind of low hanging fruit. I don't mean that in a derisive way at all. It just, mm -mm. um, it really captured, uh, some of these principles of activity design and practice design, learning design for him, for my boss in a way that was digestible. And, um, one of the things we talked about a lot is like this minimum dose of, of prescriptive intervention. If you wanted to prescribe, what's the least amount? And I know Mark Williams, uh, mm -hmm. has talked about that a little bit that I got a lot of mileage out of that. Um, just, Hey, uh, what if we approached it from the other way? So far we've been saying, Hey, look at this demonstration, see the shoulders and the knees and the elbows and the, do all that. And what is, could, could we go the other way? And what's, if you could only pick one thing or only two things, can we start there? And uh, a lot of mileage. Out of that. And, and as you'd imagine pretty quickly, it became, Whoa, uh, is that minimum intervention dose, whatever, is that zero? And uh, <laughs> pretty quickly, I think uh, we got to that point. Um, the idea that we wouldn't uh, pull anything out of the context, uh, maybe, uh, you know, I, I, we got a lot of mileage out of your, not your idea, but this idea of task simplification, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to decomposition. And, um, but yeah, it's, it, uh, again, I, I want to there's a huge caveat here and that he was mm -hmm. incredibly mature, incredibly. I mean, this is, this is an assistant coach looking up to his boss going, Hey, what if we tried something a little bit different to you may feel radical. And, uh, he's was all aboard. And, um, but yeah, looking back and, and looking at the, the current practice design, uh, that we employ here, um, at my new job, um, those are a lot of the just those nonlinear pedagogical principles are, are the ones that we lean on probably the most at an applied level. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's good. And that's a good example, like uh, in the, the creativity research, right, Casey? You have constraints too. <laughs> and having a coach above you or letting you explore is one of the great ways <laughs> that, you know, the beneficial things that can help. Um, can I Cal, just jump in for one second? Sure, Kathy, yeah. First, sorry. Um, so the, this discussion of people trying to combine it and mix it and not go all in, uh, the only way that I've been able to try to get some of our students to do it who, who weren't, I have a thousand people in a pain science course and they didn't come to this trying to go all in on any of this. And we tell them just find a context, one context, but it's extremely clear. This is the boundary of this context. And in that context, you are a hundred percent all in that you you will never be able to experience, you know, what the animal is actually capable of until you go all in, but do it in this very, you know, we're dealing with thousand pound athletes. So do it in this very safe space where, you know, it's acceptable. And we have zillions of examples of how they can do it and stay safe. And then all of your other contexts are you're the puppet master or whatever it is. And over time, of course, we see people say, no, I'm only going to do it in this one special context, this one special place. And now it's like, okay, horse, you can do all your things. And then they start growing that context until pretty soon there's, they can't go back, right? What you, you can't unsee what that can really do. So having people be binary in, you don't have to go all in on everything you do, but in some space, in this area, in this one thing, and for the pain science, we say, look, just start with doing this for the things that the animal is struggling with, movements they can't make or movements they're resisting or movements where, you know, they're, they're fighting it, they're struggling. And even though you know they're capable of it, but they don't seem to know they are. It's like, then stop the fight. <laughs> stop <laughs> trying to tell their body to do something that it's clearly not wanting to do and start using the environment and all of that. So I think having a an all-in context is an easier step than all-in everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I think, you know, the sticking to it, it, it applies, Andrew and I can, it applies at the research level too, right? Sticking to trying to explain something from ecological approach, digging hard for information and movement. And it's hard work. And if you can have an out of just saying that's a representation, it, it kind of, you it may let you give up. And I think the same with constraints, like designing intuitive, you know, interesting, ingenious constraints to, to try to um, get, you know, work on something. If you can quickly just tell them what exactly to do, that's kind of a lot easier in some ways. But um, Cal, I wanted to ask you, you um, kind of your thoughts on where, you know, where, what's the beneficial to go next uh, with this? You know, I know you've been very interactive on social media and engaged with a lot of the people, um, but we, you know, the, on both sides and, and, you know, reaching out to Michael. What do you think, you know, do, you know, should we just go to our sides and work away or, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on how we can move this forward? Yeah. Uh, just before I address that, I think just on terms of belief, I think mm -hmm. belief isn't really what it is. It's that we have been convinced by the weight of evidence. That's not belief. Belief is when you close your eyes and say, well, I, I'm holding on to it regardless. I'm not convinced, but yeah, that's not what it is. Well, not for me anyway. The, the mm -hmm. evidence that I've seen, all the literature I've read on it, has had enough weight to it, has been enough to that evidence base to convince me that the ecological approach is probably more accurate than computation and schema and just the the recall time on things turned me off instantly i used to be very very uh, married to the idea of perfect models my sport uh, i'm a judo coach so we essentially in a sport that has come from the martial art so a lot of the coaching pedagogies are from 1880 um when the sport well when judo came from jiu-jitsu so when you're saying maybe when we just do half a throw 50 times in a row with a partner that stood still, maybe that's not the best thing we can do. You're met with utter incredulity. Like how, how do you know better than Jigoro Kano? Uh, and then 
obviously you end up with the appeals to authority. You'll have an ex-world champion or somebody who medaled at the Olympics who now coaches. And you'll say, well, maybe maybe doing kata, maybe doing forms, little dance routines. I'm going to get heat for that, but they are dance routines where we have prescribed outcomes. Might not be maximal. Maybe there's other things we can do, but you're constantly met by this. So I think that is one of the hurdles to try and jump over, is that in sport, we have these existing practices that have been the case for a long time. I've tried chipping away at it by using the uh, George Best example. George Best was one of the greatest football players uh, ever born. I'm a United fan, for my shame. <laughs> um, but he was an alcoholic. Uh, he had a, a bit of a party lifestyle. So his training systems will have been completely and utterly awful for what we know and do today. But if I were to say, well, George Best did this, so that's what I'm, I'm going to go out drinking before the FA Cup final because George Best did it. It's just a, a, it's a nonsense, really. So I think having a theoretical underpinning that you can actually base what best practice is on is so much more important than this is what coaches that are elite, coaches to elite players are doing because they could be doing absolute nonsense. We could be 30 <laughs> years on saying, well, they're, they're the George Best of today. What were they thinking having these... I, I won't name a practice because again, <laughs> I'm in enough trouble for saying cats. Uh, but I think to progress things, I think not retracting into our own little bubbles. I think there's, um, I think people can be a bit overly sensitive on Twitter. I think it comes mm -hmm. from the fact that you can't judge tone when you're talking mm -hmm. to somebody and you make a joke or you're making a comment and you're face to face. They can tell from your intonation, from your inflection, from how you're poking fun or how you're just phrasing stuff that you're not being aggressive. But when you're sat behind a computer screen, it's not an important. I mean, I have to read emails out to my partner so she can tell me if I sound really rude or not. Like <laughs> I, I have no way of <laughs> no way of filtering that. So I think on Twitter, I've always tried to take it that there's an implied sense that people are genuine, they're interacting in good faith. Uh, if I think that they're being rude or blunt, I just give it I sort of glaze over it and assume that they're not until they're actively rude. You know, I've had very few instances, to be fair, uh, of people that have been, well, just rude. If they've been to the point of being offensive. Uh, and at that point, I, I'll unload. I'm, I'm in a combat sport. I quite enjoy arguing with people. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it's not an issue for me. But I think discussing it and actually engaging with people that have different views to you is the only way you can change your mind. Mm. I, I assume, I'm speaking from myself but i assume that we've all come from a position where we used to believe the conventional model of coaching we used to think well just memorize the patterns do it a hundred thousand times it'll be stuck in your head when the time comes you can recall it press play and you do the move but i've gone from that to something different because i have read about it i've discussed it with people and the weight of evidence was sufficient to be able to convince me that i was wrong mm -hmm. i think arguing is healthy Especially yeah. about politics and religion. If we can't do <laughs> ecological dynamics, then crikey, we're lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that I, I agree, Cal. And, I, I, you know, I, I kept referring to the discussion I, Mike and I had, like what we used to do at conferences. We do that all the time, sit with people across. And it's just a totally different dynamic than social media. Um, but, it, it, you know, we can't change that, I don't think. Um, but but uh, yeah, hopefully we can. I don't know if more debate, more discussions like that, or more roundtables, or it, it's just hard. It's it's hard to get people to to uh, do these kind of things. I guess Mary, one of the big, sorry. sorry. I, I guess one of the big issues is that there's there's still sort of point scoring. I've been guilty of it myself. It's it's quite fun to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was one. I'm sure everybody's seen it. The person that was doing a backflip. They had somebody given. Uh, a set of constraints to try and shape them to accommodate a backflip. And there was people gleefully sharing it and putting their perspective on it. I think, mm -hmm. Well, these things can be explained as well. <laughs> it's not like it's, yeah, yeah. So I think trying to not engage in that point scoring, despite the joy of doing it, uh, is, probably, is probably quite healthy. Um, yeah. But engage, we should engage. People disagree, yeah. it's, it's healthy. If everybody yeah, they, agreed, it'd be a very boring world. <laughs> For sure, that's how we advance, and I think understanding where the where what things need to be further developed within ecological approach is really helpful for me. Sometimes you don't see them from inside as well. 
you know, thing, especially when you try to explain someone and they keep coming back that they don't understand your explanation. That's a real red light, mo- you know, moment for me that we need to do better. Um, you know, I, uh, if you have, if they, if they haven't learned, you haven't taught kind of idea um, approach. Uh, Marianne, your, your thoughts on all this. I know you, you know, you, you have a position where you uh, coach education as well. So besides what you do, what, what, what are your thoughts on kind of how to move this or where we should go? I know. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that's, that's pretty difficult. Cause I, like you say, I sort of think about it from a sort of like coach developer perspective and how do coaches learn what a coach is paying attention to what, um, and then, then that gets into, um, I guess gets more into a representation hungry space um, mm-hmm. because then people tend to start talking about metacognition because you're watching something and you're thinking about what's going on. And I get, and also my research is as well, you know, I'm looking at um, show jumping particularly, and one of the key bits about that, and I have the most, sorry, snooty <laughs> when I'm talking. <laughs> I like, okay. who, are you, who are you talking to? It must be me. <laughs> you're only sensitive being in this room. So I, I do apologize. Um, yeah, so... Um, uh, where was I? Yeah, so you know, you walk a course, um, and and if somebody's walking a course, and again, it goes back to that anticipation thing, which I think again with coaching, coach development is is a is a similar thing. What is what are we paying attention to, and why? What information are we coming attuned to? And if you're not going to think about it from in terms of an internal representation and mental rehearsal for something, then what is it? Um, yeah, it's, and that, that, that's that's really interesting. I think I guess. And just, I'm just sort of like reflecting on some of the stuff I've been looking at in the last couple of days. We have this within coach development and with assessment and levels. They talk about, and Stu, I'd be really interested in your your view on this. Actually, the idea that um, a low level you're learning stuff, but and then at a really high level you're going to actually integrate that into practice somehow. And I'm like, actually, we want to integrate into practice right from the beginning, but maybe more simplistic or in um, a smaller context with l- less um, less complexity or less, you know, in it more local. So not as nested either, either in um, in the number of levels and timescales. Hopefully, I'm making some sense. Yeah, so I think I... I'm going. People should be actually what they're learning. They should be integrating, and it's more about attention than internal representation but yeah it's 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 fascinating and really interesting and then i'm going how do i fit that into simsper whatever that i'm kind of playing around with and can we set activities for coach coach developers at levels that fit the criteria that are there already and is the criteria at a lower level that is just about not integrating that into some kind of representative practice. So yes, Stu, mm-hmm. I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah, on that. I think those are good, the good points, Mary. And it's the kind of the fundamentals argument again. You know, can we just do we really have to learn how to swing before we play tennis, or can we just put you on a court with a lighter, less compression ball, hit it slower, smaller area, and then scale up? Yeah, I think it's good. Um, we have a question uh, from Jonathan about, um, I get asked this quite a bit about the role of modeling or a someone, a modeling and action for someone, you know, from an ecological perspective. Casey, maybe we can go, do you, you know, in volleyball, I'm sure you still have to do, you know, uh, observation and modeling a lot for, do you, how much do you use it and how do you think about it in, in your coaching? Sorry to fling that on you out of nowhere, but oh, yeah, that that's uh, it's I think really really a relevant question at least for us at, at, at an applied level. Um, so once upon a time, modeling was kind of probably what you traditionally think. Hey, here's this elite person, uh, whether it's me as the coach who was a player once upon a time, or we'll show you video of some great player, or, uh, and we'll point out all the things they do, and then your job is to go do those things, you know. And um, that we used that for a long time and then kind of migrated a long ways away from that. (laughs) Um, I would say that that probably doesn't come up uh, nearly as frequently. So the idea of modeling, is just not something that um, 
that I personally use a ton. Uh, it, it does come up some, but um, I had a, a real good conversation with Keith Davids um, about how he would conceptualize it. And I know there's been a little bit of stuff written on this. Um, but one of the things to, to preface this, and I, I won't rant, I promise, but I think one of the major things uh, that is a concern is uh, a lot of times when we start looking at like a biomechanic biomechanical model, it's an aggregate of elite performers. And isn't it Paul Glazier who's done a lot of work on like the concerns using aggregates in yeah. biomechanic analysis. And I, that was a huge moment for me in understanding that like, hey, if we just pick all the things that most of the best players do most of the time, then let's just do those things. And when I started reading Paul's work, I realized, whoa, it, there's other ways to think about this. Because it, it just, it was this logical, you know, kind of thing that made sense to me. But um, what we've done instead, uh, instead of showing this kind of aggregate, uh, idealized model, um, we look for not the things that are the same, uh, that maybe high level players. First of all, we're going to look for people that have somewhat similar constraints, if that makes any sense, maybe relevant constraints. So in volleyball, like, oh, they have similar height. They have relatively similar jumping ability, length, all those things. And we know that there's some constraints that we're just not going to be able to observe or match up well. But we're, we're going to try to match up just the, the more obvious ones whenever we can. And then we're going to look at the people who have similar constraints and look at them in, in similar contexts. And that's a huge, huge part. We can't just say, look at the biomechanics like this and ignore the set location and the moment in the game and their role on their team, et cetera, et cetera. But um, – we're going to consider the context and we're going to consider some similarity in the constraints. And then we're going to look for these, these people that are, that are having success. That maybe is the invariant. Are they succeeding in whatever thing we're trying to model? And are we then going, uh, what are they all doing differently? So what are like, what's different here? Is it two steps in their approach or three or four or five steps? Okay. That's probably a reasonable place to explore. So let, it's not do it like them. Let's just mm -hmm. identify, hey, Susie Superstar from Brazil does it like this. And Sally Elite Player, whatever, from France does it like this. And uh, they do it differently. Okay, those areas of difference are really good places for you to try a bunch of stuff, to just explore. Mm -hmm. Because you're kind of built like them phys physiologically. And uh, maybe, you know, uh, you, you're capable, you're theoretically capable of some of the same things. So just try stuff in there. So looking at um, demonstration as more of like a, I think someone said this earlier, so I'm, I'm stealing it from whoever said it, but looking at like an all you can eat buffet where I try a little bit of this and a little bit of that and something's going to taste good. Mm -hmm. And uh, as opposed to saying, hey, here's the mashed potatoes and you're going to like them or not, period. And uh, I'm getting Kind of way off course here, I apologize. <laughs> no, no. My, anal my analogies are running out, but that's how, that's how we use uh, the the modeling and demonstration stuff. Yeah, no, no, that's great, Casey. And I, I think the way you described it, for me, modeling is a perfect example of my point. I always make ecological dynamics is principles, not tools. Right? It doesn't preclude you from using any coaching tool you want. It doesn't make your toolbox smaller. It just uses it in a different way. Use imitation to explore. Like getting an athlete try to swing like Roger Federer, I think that's a great thing to do. It gets, they have to pick up the dynamics of the information. They have to try to control. But it's not using it here. Look, watch me do it the right way. That's the that's a just that's using modeling for a different purpose, right? It's the same tool, different principles. That's that's the I always try to <laughs> it keeps getting lost in there. But that's a great example. I love the looking for differences. I think I said that uh, I uh, I was telling someone that the other day too. That was like a turning point for me in understanding hitting. What are people doing differently? Because then that pulls out the invariance. What what has to be there and what doesn't? Yeah, that's a great example. And, and Rob, to, to, sorry, to that point, I think for me, what helped to, to just finish off that thought from, from you right there, um, it's for a long time, it was, hey, let's identify the invariant features and just hammer those and hammer those and hammer those. And when I realized uh, that, hey, <laughs> if these are genuinely invariant features, whether I hammer them or not, they're going to show up. <laughs> and so I don't need to worry about them that much, uh, maybe at all, theoretically, because they'll be there. If we get mm. the intention right and the attention right, then they will be there. And so let's focus on the stuff that's different. And in that point, hey, what works for you? And then can we add a little bit more is kind of where I landed. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stu, did you want to chime in? I thought you. 
Well, it goes back. I mean, just to jump jump on that because there's like there's just so that was just such a brilliant kind of uh, like look into uh, practically you know applications of of some of these uh, dimensions, Casey. So I love all that, and you just got like loads of thoughts sparking off. But what you made me think of in my world specifically, um, and it's interesting, interesting, Robin, you talk about kind of things like modeling. So. Like I've got about four children in my group. They're probably all about 10 now. And for whatever reason, they all strangely enough, they all come from the same school. And for whatever reason, they all play field hockey the wrong way, right? And I'm using that very deliberately, <laughs> right? For if it's listen, I'm using inverted commas, right? What I mean is, is that traditionally Field hockey is played with your stick on the right hand side of your body, right? And if you move the ball on the other side of the body, traditionally what you do, because you can only use one side of the stick. It's not like ice hockey where you can use both. You have to turn the stick over and use only one side, the flat side of the stick, the rounded side on the other side you can't use. So you turn it over to manipulate the ball. And if you have the ball on that side of your body, traditionally what you do is you keep your left hand on the top of the stick and you turn a ball over and you, and you move over and you just cross your hands over your body and then you run with it on that side. More often than not, you just take one hand off and, and do it with one hand. And I've got a group of children, three, four children, who all play with the ball on the other side of their body, the left side of their body. Now, on some levels, it can sometimes be a bit of an issue because you're like literally going body to body instead of stick to stick with somebody. But anyway, this is how they play. And in order to do that, they have to play with the stick essentially upside down. Right? So it's got some limitations to it, you know, in the sense of their ability to propel the ball and hit it and all those sorts of things. But that's how they play. So you think to yourself, right, so what do we do here? So I was talking to a parent about this and saying, like, it's really interesting. So what I've done with this group is I've said, I love the way you play on this side. This is great. I also want you to try it on the other side, too. So you can do both. Now, interestingly enough, I've never said that to other kids, <laughs> but for this particular group, I have. So it's kind of, why am I saying this? Anyway, but the point I'm trying to say is, is that like, okay, this is your your way of doing it. This is how you approach the problem of the game. This is how it feels right to you. Explore the other side too. And now I was talking to a parent about this the other day. I was saying, do you notice how he just instantly switches without even thinking about it. And so what 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 he does is instead of going, right, I'm going to play on this side of my body and I'm going to have my hands across me, which is kind of weird, he just switches his hands naturally on the stick and plays that way. So now he's got a superpower because no one can see, no one can understand it. It does. It's not a normal picture. Like, how do I tackle that? They're on the wrong side of me. Like, how do I get to the, oh, now they're moving it that way and I didn't expect that. So going back to the points of deception and things like that, it, it's 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 essentially it's, a, it's an abnormal way of carrying the ball. So it's actually now a point of difference, and it's got its own strength. So it's now made me think. Listening to to Casey, just going back to what I was saying earlier on, that's something I should be saying. Carry the ball. On. Now I I do do that. By the way, I do say carry the ball on this side, and we do a lot of. You can actually only play with the ball on this side, just for for the fun of it and the experience and the enjoyment. But what I've never done is say and also carry the ball on this side, but use your hands the other way around like this boy and this boy and this girl and this girl do. So that's interesting now. And now you're making me think about that. <laughs> so I've got to start exploring a bit more. Yeah. You know, that That's interesting. We, I've, I've played around that a bit in baseball, actually, too. Um, there's some batters that can hit from both sides of the plate. They're switch hitters. But the other ones we've done kind of we call a bilateral training. Just try to swing the bat. Try to and then try to do the swing right handed from the left side of the plate and do all these just getting them to move through those patterns is, is kind of they get this kind of more information. Cal, did you? I yeah, thought... yeah. So we have a, a massive bias towards left handers in combat sport, like across the field. If you look at elite level, there's a massive over overrepresentation of left hand left handed players. Uh, and I think it's purely because you don't experience it you're not attuned to left-handed players anyway near the level you are a right-handed player if it's what one in 30 in the general population left-handed and i think it's about 50 percent of people in most combat sports uh boxing is not quite as heavy judo i think is very heavy uh fencing seeing andrew saying he's a lefty mm -hmm. very very overrepresented and it, it my my assumption is that it is purely down to the fact that you consistently practice against right-handers the a dime a dozen, but 
you don't get anywhere near as much time practicing against left-handers. But left-handers constantly get to practice against right-handers. Mm -hmm. So they're just naturally biased. So I suppose you've essentially ended up in that same situation. You have people that are left-handed, they're playing <laughs> upside down and left-handed. But the fact you've got a, a single-edged stick adds an extra thing. So it's not like orthodox for southpaw because you're just mirroring and doing the same things but on the opposite side. But you can't do the same things on opposite sides because your stick's upside down. I can't shoot. I can't propel the ball with anywhere near the same amount of force. So it's really interesting. It creates an extra dynamic to it. It's going to open up interesting opportunities for the people learning to play against them as well. So I, I was never a very good fencer, but when I was fencing as an undergrad, I'd say I'm a lefty. And for quite a while, I, I, like I was the first lefty who'd been there for a while. And so for quite a while, I had a real advantage over fences who were much better at me and then they very quickly learned the new lines because it's just everything's coming from different directions but they all they all got better at fencing me right um, and so I was just thinking about how weird it looks from the point of view of the person trying to figure out how to, to defend them but of course it's opening up it's not just opening up all kinds of interesting new uh, attacking opportunities and superpowers but you're actually exposing everybody else who's playing around them to learning how to combat those superpowers, which is just going to open up all kinds of interesting spaces as well. It's just, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, but the, the, those kind of things are very fascinating. I've been working with this group. There's this kind of new thing in the U.S. where they have these tournaments of combat sports where the every event has different size ring rules, equipment. <laughs> it's like on the, It's like adaptability to the maximum it's it's very it's very cool so um i had a question about we have another question by jacob about the scaffolding um i think i've said before that scaffolding as i understand it scaffolding the idea of scaffolding doesn't align with the ecological approach um i don't know if anyone else has for me i think of scaffolding as building a building right very linear i'm going to develop your attention skills or we're going to learn, teach you how to dribble a soccer ball. Then on top of that, I can add playmaking after you get the foundation. It's very linear fundamentals. That's why I don't think it quite fits with with uh, the ecological approach. I don't know if anyone has any other come across that term or anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah. we're a combat sport. So we throw people mm -hmm. around. So there is quite a high degree of, please don't let my five-year-old pick your five-year-old <laughs> up and drop them on the head. Uh, so instead of having completely open practices, often I'll scaffold a basic version of a technique, of awful word, basic model of what it looks like, uh, just so that they have a space that they can explore in. Um, mm. So the scaffolding is not this is the right way, but this is a safe way that this can be done. Explore around that space rather than you put your left foot here. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit less... Um, less structured. So you give them a basic outline of what it looks like and then let them play. I think that's, yeah. that's how I, how I see scaffolding rather than, yeah. Yeah. I think Andrew is mentioning it. And I think it's, I think it's a semantics thing. Part of it. I think it's constraining. I would call what you're doing constraining. I think there's a, a, a theory in learning of scaffolding that has a very traditional. Um, so I guess it depends on how you use the word, but I think you're right. Building, you know, building, adding constraints, taking them away. You know, I think I think that's a thing. So, along similar lines, Rob, I just think of it yeah. slightly differently as well, which is, um, it's about kind of defining the search space. Mm -hmm. So, I think of a scaffold more like a a, a way of kind of. I thought about it in a, I use different language than a scaffold, but for example, mm -hmm. if there is this vast landscape of possibility. And we can go and ex explore, explore in that landscape of possibility. It's it's just as likely we could get lost in that landscape. Mm -hmm. So what we might decide to do is to say, well, actually, we're just going to play in these fields for a bit, or we're going to, mm -hmm. you know, sort of close the gates and just play in this field, and then and that defines the action possibilities within that one field. So that's another way of framing it for me. It's like you know, it's I'm all I'm doing is defining what's possible within this context. Yes, it's it's constraints in reality. But what they are are instead of like, say, action constraints or constraints that maybe lead towards various action possibilities or invitations to action or or information sources where action might be derived from. What they are are 
it's just defining the 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 where how how far we can go within a context it's a little bit like game rules that you and michael talked about you know you talked about finding game rules that essentially define what's possible in a context Mm-hmm. And I could really geek out about rules, and I really wanted to geek out about rules, and I was listening, but I won't. <laughs> but but you know, you actually can create a set of game rules that then create, you know, a kind of more defined and tightly constrained version of the bigger game that just defines where we're going to where we're going to operate within. Which, like Al- Cal says, can also be a means by which to ensure safety. Mm-hmm. So it's that's how I see scaffolding. It's just, but it's a different. I know that there is this other theory around scaffolding mm-hmm. that is different. It's about it's almost like a, a a way of articulating a so without being like a linear method of teaching. It's saying it's still linear each time, but there's different ways of approaching linearity. <laughs> you can mm-hmm. choose your linearity, yeah. which is not what I'm talking about at all. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a, as I half remember, scaffolding was from zone of proximal development, right? You've got an area that you have knowledge, you have a more knowledgeable level that is scaffolding your learning so that you can reach the, the new level, which sounds very, very linear, as we say. But the way I see it and the way that I would say we use it is by creating constrained practice tasks. We, um, hopefully, the more knowledgeable other, we can create and design practice tasks with representative learning design that yeah. essentially look to create a more proficient motor problem solver. We're looking for them to be right. better at a thing, at a task, at solving an issue. And we scaffold a practice task that stretches them past their comfort where they can already where they're already competent to extend their competency. So I think that it is it is scaffolding using constraints. I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think the you're right. I think the general idea, I totally agree with. So maybe I shouldn't uh, pick on that uh, that term because I just confuse people. But uh, um, but yeah, no, I I think uh, that, that that's a really a really good question. So I think uh, we've been at this for a while. So I think uh, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, any last comments or thoughts people want to throw out there? Um, if not, we'll. Uh, um, I thanks everyone for joining me. And yeah, like I said, we'll. No, hopefully we have more discussions and, and debates about this and and we'll 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 meet again sometime our the ecological explorers as we like to call ourselves we'll meet we'll do this again sometime soon okay thanks everyone thanks rob thanks rob. Rob. 400, rob congrats well done <laughs> and yes congrats. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakyWaits. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.